thank you for coming along. Uh, Steve and I were a bit behind the times today, so apologize, apologies for that. Uh, just so that you are aware, Steve is sort of sitting in the background and able to deal with any issues, questions or problems. The notes are available for you, the handouts are available for you, the slides will be made available for you and we are recording today. So if you'd like a copy of the recording, if you contact Robert or Stephen at Stuart Title, they I'm sure will endeavour to assist. We're looking at some good habits relating to new builds today. If anyone has any questions or queries, then you can put your questions and queries in the chat facility and Steve and I will deal with those at the end. I'll also, as usual, provide you with an email address if you have any questions or queries that arise from anything that I say or you have any points that you'd like me to amplify or explore any further. I'm more than happy to do that. But we'll get cracking because we're uh, sort of a bit behind the time. So thanks very much for coming along. Yeah, some good habits with regard to new builds. What I thought today is we'll have a look at some 10 good habits, but we'll also sort of introduce some developments and some reform of the law that enables you to sort of keep abreast of what's happening with regard to new builds, but at the same time reinforcing some of the points that I'll be making in connection with some good habits to have in the conveyancing process as it applies to new builds. So the first thing really to talk about with regard to new build is what can cause problems in connection with say freehold purchases. We'll look at leasehold purchases in a little more detail a little later. Well on screen here are a number of issues that can uh, generate problems. Uh, Non-compliance with planning permissions, building regulations etc can cause issues and the point really and the good habit here is no matter how good the developer's lawyers are now, how reputable or of national or international repute the builder or developer is, from time to time, things go wrong. So I've dealt with negligence claims where developers have built houses and they haven't had planning permission, have altered house types, uh, and the original house types were as per planning permission, but new house types weren't. Market conditions meant that sort of four-bedroom detached houses weren't selling but three bedroom townhouses would sell and quickly the developer changes the scheme but doesn't have the appropriate permission to do so. And also in addition to that, there are planning conditions that can be imposed, particularly section 106 agreements, that warrant or justify further investigation. So the first habit really with regard to planning is to make sure that you are satisfied that the appropriate permissions have been granted relevant to the development and significantly where there are issues that warrant or justify further investigation to make sure that the client understands what your role is with regard to planning. As I've emphasized in a lot of these webinars over the years, you're not a planning consultant, you're a transactional property lawyer and therefore if there are concerns or issues with regard to planning issues, then you should be telling the client to get the appropriate advice. As a residential conveyancer, your task is to identify that there is the appropriate planning permission in place to allow the development, allow, to allow the building of your client's new property, and that there aren't any constraints relating to planning that will impact on your client's objective. So very important to make sure that the planning status of the development, the building, the property is in place to make sure section 106 conditions or other planning conditions are being uh, applied to and being complied with and making sure if our client has anything unusual with regard to objective concerning planning or intentions with regard to development of the property or site in the future that the client and you, and you understand what your role is, what you're going to do and not going to do with regard to ongoing development. The reason I mention that is uh, I dealt with a matter a few weeks ago where a developer uh, sold a plot to a client and uh, had built a house, but the client didn't want that house at all, wanted something radically different. And therefore the intention was that he was paying a lot of money, an awful lot of money in essence for a plot, but was then going to uh, take down the existing dwelling and build something different. Now the point there was, was he entitled to do so? answer no as far as planning was concerned there were constraints as to the development in addition to that of course there were constraints relating to covenants concerning alterations etc that the 
Bayer was going to fall foul of, given his intentions. And the problem arose as to what the conveyancer did or didn't do with regard to advising the client about what could be done relating to this property. And the million dollar question, the client hadn't told the conveyancer about what he intended to do. So be careful about planning. Same thing with regard to NHBC. Now, NHBC documentation and dealing with NHBC documentation is a relatively simple task these days. Problems can arise with regard to failure to arrange NHBC inspections in time to enable completion to take place, more on that in a moment or two, and failing to advise clients about the limitations relating to an NHBC agreement. I repeat, it isn't enough to email across to the client or refer the client to the NHBC website with regard to the cover that's afforded by NHBC or indeed any other insurance provider. Your task as a conveyance is to explain to the client the limitations relating to an NHBC policy and to explain to the client its limitations and the limitations imposed on a developer with regard to issues such as snagging and minor repairs etc. Also important that the client understands the finite duration of the insurance cover that NHBC provides and the limitations with regard to NHBC protection with regard to developer insolvency with regard to deposits. All of these things need to be explained to the clients very carefully indeed. I'm going to talk to you in a moment or two about a nightmare that I've been dealing with recently concerning roads and sewers and Section 38 agreement and bonds, ex uh, agreements and bonds, et cetera, and intentions on the developer's part to carry out further and additional development relating to a site that impacted on a buyer. And we'll talk about that in a moment or two. But again, the basic point and the good habit, what are the designs for estate roads and footpaths, et cetera? Are estate roads going to be adopted? What is the extent of that adoption? So again, I'm doing some work at the moment with regard to Section 38 agreements and bonds and identifying the extent of the land that the agreement and bond covers. In this particular case that I'm looking at at the moment, not all of the development is covered by the agreement and bond. There is part of the site that is out with the agreement and bond that the developer is retaining. And the reason that I'm involved in, in that particular issue is that there's an issue with regard to an estate rent charge being utilised to cover the cost of the works relating to that area. Again, the problem is that the conveyancer involved in that transaction didn't appreciate that not all of the development was covered by the Section 38 agreement on the bond, that there are roads, paths and um, sort of uh, amenity sites on the development that are out with the agreement on bond that the developer will continue to maintain. In addition to that, there are areas of roadway that are uh, not metal, but in fact are block paved. And again, the agreement and bond doesn't cover those areas. So again, there's a need to be careful with regard to that, because although the roads will be adopted, they won't be maintainable at public expense, they are outside the agreement. Non-compliance with plans and specifications. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, changes that we're going to see with regard to contractual provisions relating to um, changes of specification plans, etc. Something that frequently arises, again, in new build contracts, invariably the developer will retain a degree of flexibility as to what they can and can't do with regard to altering plans and specifications. Uh, and again, Sometimes what you'll see in a contract is very developer friendly, but very uh, negative, very um, intrusive as far as the buyer is concerned. So again, we've got to be careful. We can't just say to the client, there's a contract, read it. You've got to explain to the client the contractual provisions and explain how they will impact on the purchase. So where a developer is entitled to alter floor areas, entitled to alter the types of materials that's being used, what controls, what protection does a buyer have with regard to the developer flexibility? Is the buyer aware that it is possible to change some of the design features of the property and that the buyer will not be able to withdraw from the contract or indeed complain about what is done on the basis that the contract permits it? Again, we'll have a look at the new code of practice there because there's some interesting provisions within it 
which would be useful as good habits for us to adopt in connection with advising clients before the code comes in force. With regard to documentation, again, it's important that clients understand that as far as documentation is concerned, it isn't possible to insist on a developer altering standard documentation used for development for our particular property. So we are left with a situation where perhaps we've had previous buyers and their lawyers willing to accept contractual terms and in essence our client being left with no option but to go along and follow along with what exists on the basis that the developer can't alter the contract, can't alter the transfer because of commitment that has been given to other buyers that have purchased and completed before us. So this inability to vary standard contracts and transfer created by developers needs to be explained to the client. And again, the detrimental effect of that provision needs explaining. And as we'll see a little later in my presentation today, leaseholds, new leasehold flats uh, are causing issues and problems. We've discussed those in the past, so I'm not going to dwell too much on them, but I am going to dwell on issues and problems associated with leasehold houses in a little more detail. So there are issues for conveyances to be aware of and to deal with, and there are a number of good habits associated with those issues. So let's just have a look at those for a moment. We've already discussed the issue of planning permission. It is not enough to provide our client with a copy of planning permission and planning conditions and say, read it. We've got to explain to the client the significance and consequence of the planning permission that's been made available in connection with the property. It's also important, in my view, to think about the bigger picture. So at the moment, we may have phase one of a development. That means that our client is acquiring a property that uh, adjoins some very picturesque woodland. But the client needs to be aware of the fact that part of that woodland is likely to be felled for phase two, phase three or phase four of the development. And that planning permission has been granted that will enable housing to be built proximate to the plot that our client has currently acquired. So particularly these days where you're seeing big schemes and particularly where you're seeing big schemes being divided up between a number of developers, it's important that our client sees the bigger picture with regard to planning. And again, given the needs of our client, it may be necessary and appropriate for additional searches to be undertaken, additional investigations to be undertaken about what's planned for the vicinity on the basis that what is planned for this vicinity will have an impact on our client's decision as to whether or not to proceed with this particular property. Roads, drains and sewers, again, do watch out for the linking or connection between roads, drains and sewers. So I've seen a situation in connection with a large housing development where there's a problem with regard to the drains and sewers that are being built, meaning that the roads can't be finished and metal on the basis that there's repair works that are needed to drains and sewers that are being constructed. Those drains and sewers have been like that for over six years. And the development, this large development, hasn't had its roads metalled and roads finished as a consequence of an inability to do so until the drain and sewer position is resolved. Again, we've got to check the position, make sure that we're connecting our drainage and water searches with what is revealed by our local land charges searches in COM29 to make sure that we are comfortable that if there are problems with drains and sewers, how is that going to impact? with regard to roads and footpaths? And is the impasse relating to drains and sewers going to be resolved, meaning that ultimately the roads can be finished, adopted, and uh, the site completed? The bigger picture with leasehold transactions is a point that I've made to you before. And again, I've just been doing some work recently on this point. You can't simply focus in on the lease that your client is acquiring. You've got to explain the bigger picture with regard to the dangers of leasehold ownership. We'll be touching on some of them, and we've mentioned some in the past, haven't we? Ground rent, ground rent reviews, etc. But things like the duties and obligations that are owed by a leaseholder to a landlord, the limited duties and obligations that are owed by the landlord to the leaseholder need explaining. The fact that a leasehold transaction puts our client at a distinct disadvantage compared to a freehold transaction where our client is buying a house rather than a flat. 
The imposition of restrictive covenants in connection with new, new bills needs explaining. And here in particular, not only should we be listing which restrictive covenants are listed in contract and transfer, which will be binding on our client, but we've also got to explain to our client who can impose those restrictive covenants, the mechanisms for imposition, the mechanisms for dispute resolution. So you cannot, if I'm a client, simply send, uh, copy and paste from the transfer or from the contract the restrictive covenants that are going to be imposed on me. You've got to explain to me how those covenants can be enforced and if so, by whom. Again, with regard to new build, I wouldn't be explaining to clients the fact that restrictive covenants are capable of variation, etc., because that's going to be highly unlikely in connection with a new property to arise anywhere in the near future or medium term. But nonetheless, we do have to explain to the clients how or the mechanism for the enforcement of restrictive covenants. And also to be satisfied that where there are breaches, whoever can enforce will enforce. So if you've got a situation where it is the developer's responsibility to enforce breaches of restrictive covenant, is there some form of ADR or dispute resolution mechanism? that the developer can utilize against the party that's in breach and that our client can use where a complaint about a breach to a developer has not been properly actioned. And we've already discussed the issue with regard to NHBC or other cover. Is there cover in place? Is it satisfactory? Does our client understand the limitations relating to it? Is the cover going to be sufficient to enable our client to be indemnified? against construction defects. I mention in the notes, in some detail, all of these issues. But before we go any further, I do want to share with you a cautionary tale concerning CON 29 and Inquiry 3.4 and Inquiry 4, which touches on the point that I made a little earlier about the bigger picture relating to schemes. Remember, Inquiry 3.4, about road schemes within 200 meters of the property. But what's the position if there are schemes that are beyond 200 meters that could impact on the client? About 10 days ago now, I was talking to someone that was uh, working with a search provider and was telling me about a development, client buying a property that was sort of in the midst of a big housing development. And that inquiry three four and inquiry four didn't extract sufficient information from the local authority to enable the client to take a realistic view as to whether this property was, was worth buying or not. Because although there was disclosed information about schemes within 200 meters of the property that revealed sort of phase one, phase two of development, which were relatively small scale developments, the 200 meter distance did not provide information about stages or um, uh, stages three and four of the development, which were vast. So stage one and two shows an additional 20 or 30 dwellings. Stages three and four, 400 dwellings, 380 dwellings. And again, all of those dwellings theoretically using roads that adjoined or were proximate to the target property. Now, in query four, ask about road proposals that are adjoining or adjacent to the property. So you might think, well, all right, we're outside of the 200 meter radius for three, four, and three, four really is asking us about road schemes that the county council our local authority are going to be responsible for. Inquiry 4 asks about road proposals being undertaken by the developer. But again, here there's a limitation, adjoining or adjacent to the property. So what do we mean by adjacent? Well, parcels of land that aren't widely separated. What on earth does that mean? Where we talk about adjoining, no land between the two parcels of land concerned. So you do see how on a big scheme, there might be road proposals in connection with land that isn't adjoining, that isn't adjacent, but will impact on your client's purchase. 
in this particular case that I was sort of reviewing and discussing with someone, luckily the seller had disclosed the fact that they were aware of some additional development, not all of it, and had basically misled the buyer in connection with the TA form and their response. They were aware of a lot more, a lot more intensified development and a greater geographical development than they'd let on. So do be careful. Now, I'm not saying again that all of a sudden we've got to spend a vast amount of time and energy in determining the position with regard to the bigger picture concerning the development or developments. But what I am saying, I think, is that we should be explaining to clients the limitations relating to CON 29 and perhaps advising a client that it might be appropriate that a highway search is undertaken to determine just what is planned with regard to the locality. And again, I think I might have mentioned in the past the fact that you might have a client buying a property in a village and there aren't any road schemes or proposals anywhere near it. But there might be a village in the vicinity, and when we say about a vicinity, it might be five or six miles away, where there's a huge scheme envisaged, and that traffic may use our village, where our client is buying a property, as a rat run. So it doesn't matter that there's a sort of road proposal that means the vast majority of the traffic in village number two will be going an alternative route. The fact is, the reality will be that some of that traffic will be using our village and perhaps causing problems or issues. So again, it's back to this point about setting realistic client expectation, isn't it? About making sure clients understand the limitations relating to the conveyancing process. So I just thought I'd share with you that sort of tale of woe. And uh, it's quite interesting to sort of highlight some of the limitations relating to CON 29. And I know that there are moves afoot to change some of the inquiries so that when we're looking at bigger schemes, that uh, inquiry three, four and inquiry four aren't just limited to a 200 metre radius or aren't limited to adjoining or adjacent properties. And do watch out for section 38 highways agreements and bonds. What's the extent of the land that's subject to the agreement? And another point, which I haven't mentioned so far, watch out for commuted payments for maintenance. Where a local authority or a county council is looking at highways in connection with a development, particularly where the developer is undertaking works relating to highways that is aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, but far more expensive than simple tarmacking, or paving stones, local authorities are looking and saying, we're not able to quantify just what it's gonna cost us to repair or maintain this area, this piece of property that we're adopting. So what we'll do is we will require commuted payments for maintenance on an ongoing basis. And the roll on effect of that is that the developer will then be looking to try and limit or exclude its liability for those commuted payments and again may be turning to estate rent charges in connection with freehold schemes and service charge with regard to leasehold schemes that again our client needs to be aware of and needs to understand that we won't be in a position to calculate or formulate just what the cost will be going forward. There are some procedural issues that are worth exploring. And again, there are some good habits that can be adopted here that we need to know about. Not in the notes, but we're familiar with them, I'm sure. Reservation fees. What are the reservation fees? What's the position for getting a reservation fee paid back to us where our client doesn't proceed? What's the position for disputes concerning reservation agreements? And what's the provision? with regard to an actual written reservation agreement. Again, when we look at the Consumer Code for Home Builders, we'll look at this in a little more detail. As far as deposits are concerned, we should always be telling our buyer client where the deposit is being paid to the developer as agent rather than stakeholder. The client needs to understand the significance of that. We need to, on exchange of contracts, need to consider the issue of protecting the contract 
And remember, my philosophy is always that we use agreed notices rather than unilateral notices to protect contracts. Someone emailed me yesterday and said, right, Ian, what's the golden rule for protecting a contract? Is it necessary where there is a delay between exchange and completion of more than three months to protect, but less than three months it's not necessary? And the answer, unfortunately, is there is not such a golden rule. My philosophy is that where we are exchanging contracts and there is likely to be a delay in completion, no matter who the seller developer is, I would contemplate protecting the contract where there's a delay beyond three months. But where I'm dealing with a developer that I don't know, where I'm dealing with a small scale developer, not a national house builder, where I'm concerned about the solvency or otherwise of the developer, I would contemplate protecting the contract where completion was to take place less than three months. And where I was exceedingly wary of the seller developer, I may consider protecting the contract even where there's a delay of a period of, say, a fortnight. But there'd have to be some form of indication to me that there could be a problem or where, for example, I'm buying from a builder or developer that's in administration. Would I think about protecting a contract where there's that relatively short gap? And again, the good habit with regard to completion is to make sure that we are, courtesy of the contract, allowed sufficient time to enable our NHB inspector or other insurance inspector to inspect before completion, to enable our surveyor or valuer to inspect in good time, and to enable us to draw down funds and undertake pre-completion searches before completion. Again, the consumer code for home builders suggests that a minimum period of time uh, from which, uh, from the date of notification of practical completion by the builder or developer requiring the buyer to complete should be a minimum of 14 days. So I've bleated on about the consumer code for home builders, not in force yet, and the new Homes Quality Code for Home Builders, also not yet in force. And I want to just have a look at it for you to share some things that I think are interesting that are going to become enforceable when the code goes live, but which are useful indicators as to what we should be looking for today when dealing with new builds. The first thing to understand and appreciate is that the code, the new homes quality code for house builders applies to house builders that are going to be code compliant. So they need to be registered in order to be bound by the code. The idea of the code is that it fills the gaps that statutory protection and common law uh, have missed. It requires builders to have an aftercare service, a robust complaints procedure, and imposes on them a regime that to an extent redresses the balance that perhaps was in favour of developers in the past. It emphasises the need to protect vulnerable customers. And again, that's interesting, isn't it? We're seeing a lot of that in a lot of codes of practice and a lot of points generally about good conveyancing practice. The idea that there isn't such a thing as the usual client and the fact that we've got to be aware of vulnerable clients, inexperienced clients, pressurised clients. The code is designed to protect vulnerable customers, requires builders to take into account client customer vulnerability, requires builders to provide relevant information during the sales process so that our buyer clients are forearmed or forewarned about what they're going to be subject to when the contract pack hits your inbox. There is a requirement for fair reservation agreements, time to enable cooling off, and specific requirements for contracts for new builds. It should ensure that developers have um, consideration for buyers, surveyors, valuers, insurers 
carrying out pre-completion inspection. Allowing the time to ensure that clients have opportunity to take advice in connection with documentation that's submitted to them pre-exchange, pre-completion, and to enable a right of redress and dispute resolution by way of after completion and after care. So I've given you lots of details about all of this. There are one or two points that I want to share. Before we do this, two points. The code will only apply to developers that are registered with a new home's quality board and the aftercare provision that the code promotes applies for two years from legal completion. The key features of the code are the provision of information early on so that clients aren't reserving plots without being fully au fait with what their contractual obligations will be and what developers are building and what uh, commitments the buyer is expected to meet if the transaction proceeds. There is management and control of early bird or plot options. You know, the opportunity to buy off plan, etc., if a deposit is paid, and a limit, £150 ceiling, with regard to reservation fees for early bird or plot option. Again, there are details in the notes. In addition to that, there is provision relating to reservation agreements, stipulating that as far as the agreement is concerned, it must enable pre-completion procedure and documentation to be explained to the buyer. That there should be an opportunity for a buyer to walk away, thus a cooling off period. There should be provision that the buyer is provided with as much information as is reasonably possible about ongoing costs that would have to be met by the buyer in the event of a reservation agreement leading to exchange and completion. It is important to understand that as far as cancellation is concerned, the period of cooling off is 10 calendar days and there is an obligation for any reservation fee to be refunded without deduction and in full that reservation agreements can be cancelled that the details of the new home property type plot number development name address of the property if possible parking arrangements are disclosed so all of these things with regard to the reservation agreement shed some light on the commitment that the buyer may be required to undertake assuming the transaction proceeds. So there we've got a little bit more depth, a little bit more comfort, a little bit more protection for home buyers. The good habit, I think, is to look at this code and say to ourselves, all well, right, the code may not in fact be effective until 2023 but the major developers should be providing us with documentation that is code compliant now and certainly next year as far as the contract is concerned there is an obligation that the contract contains provisions that are clear fair and written in plain language it must define the legal completion notice period clearly state when a buyer can terminate the contract. Specify what happens if there is an issue with regard to delay. Explain how contracts are be, uh, sorry, contract deposits are to be protected and suitable provisions to facilitate um, an explanation of the two-year builder's liability period, the after sales protection that I alluded to earlier. It should also deal with how the contract can be varied and how specification, design, construction and materials can vary post-exchange. 
all of this, I think, is useful and, again, should be utilised by conveyances when approving or advising upon reservation agreements in the contract. Now, the way I would do it would be this. If I've got a developer that's got an old-fashioned type of contract that is no way, shape or form code compliant, I would be saying to my client, look, this is what the contract says. In our opinion, this is what best practice should mean the contract should include. So what we're doing there is using the code as a means of explaining to the client the deficiencies within the contract and the vulnerability that those deficiencies generate. I state in the notes that where there is to be a change in design, construction and materials post-exchange, there is an obligation on the developer builder to consult. So there isn't a unilateral opportunity to vary. There has to be a discussion, dialogue between developer and customer as to what's happening. Also important to understand that where there are changes to size, appearance, etc., that are minor changes that perhaps the contract permits, it is important that there is an obligation on the developer to notify the client, the buyer client, of what is being done. Not giving the customer a right to cancel but simply, again, dialogue, notification. Where a developer has agreed to do additional works for the client buyer, so, you know, the kind of thing we see, instead of having a half tile kitchen or bathroom, the developer agrees to tile a lot, then again, it is important to understand that the contract specifies the work that's being done, the standard of work, what happens with regard to cost, is it being met by developer or is there an additional cost? And the code suggests that the parties should explore whether or not timescales for completing the property need to be put back as a consequence of work that is being done. All of these things are dealt with. In addition to that, what's quite new is that where completion has taken place, the property must be constructed to the standard agreed per as per specification and contract. The developer must have carried out a final quality assurance inspection and provided the customer with a schedule of incomplete or defective items, which includes a statement of timescales for completion or remedying the works. At completion, there must be a home demonstration and the builder developer must explain and provide details of the new home warranty for the property that is being provided by the developer. It must provide the buyer client with a complaints procedure and generally speaking, provide sort of handover documentation that makes the buyer experience of moving into the property better than you are currently seeing. It's amazing how infrequently developers are sort of um, client friendly with regard to handover after completion has taken place. The code specifies a number of things where there are works that need to be done to the property and also works that need to be done with regard to the development. Clusters incomplete works to property and development. Incomplete works to the property, time scale. Written document, this is what we think is still outstanding. This is what we're going to do. This is when it will be done by. As far as development works, the developer is obliged to advise a customer of known future phases of work on the development that the developer is committed to. So that we've moved in, the developer is now under an ongoing obligation to tell us about what they're doing 
relating to the remainder of the site. I give you a lot of details relating to after sales service, but again, in short, the developer has to tell the buyer about the after sales service procedure. And in addition to that, an explanation of management of service calls or problems that arise. And a complaints handling process that includes an ability for either party to refer to the new home's ombudsman service. More on that in a moment or two. So what you've got here is quite a radical change in process requiring developers to be more upfront about what a buyer is committing to when reserving plots a requirement to be more buyer friendly with regard to contractual terms requiring builders and developers to take into account the difficulties that a buyer can encounter with regard to completion processes and new build, and then enabling participation in decision-making processes that impact upon the buyer, and a requirement for disclosure relating to uh, procedures, systems, and processes adopted after completion. This after-sales service period of two years is interesting, requiring the builder or developer to deal with problems and issues, not just snagging, that are encountered by the buyer during that period, entirely independent of any insurance protection that the buyer may have the benefit of. So have a look at all of that. There's a lot of detail in the notes. I want to scamper on and talk about some other things quickly. Uh, estate rent charges. I mentioned already that we might see more use of estate rent charges on the basis that instead of selling leasehold houses, developers are selling freehold houses, but they're reserving land for amenity. They are being hit with commuted payments relating to roads and uh, footpaths, as I mentioned earlier. And we're also seeing the use of conservation covenants as part of the development process. So estate rent charges are simply um, facilities enabling a developer to insist on payment relating to works that are undertaken by the developer relating to retained land. I had a debate with a number of people on Monday about Section 121 of the Law of Property Act 1925. A lot of practitioners are telling me that some developers are agreeing to exclude the operation of Section 121, meaning that the dreadful uh, default remedy of the creation of a sort of fictitious lease can't be utilised. And what I've said to them is what I'll say to you. I don't think you can exclude the operation of Section 121 of the LPA 1925. And the reason for that is this. The developer has the benefit of an estate rent charge, which is a legal interest in land. The developer sells the site to a management company at a later date. Well, how can the developer exclude the entitlement under section 121 of the managing management company or managing agent to enforce an unpaid estate rent charge by the creation of a section 121 lease or another method of enforcement? So what I say to practitioners is what I say to you in the notes, that what you should be doing is looking at protecting the client by insisting on a cap or ceiling on the amount of the estate rent charge, imposing an obligation on the rent charge owner to make formal demand and a requirement that a reminder is sent before enforcement action is begun. Provision, as we see in leasehold transactions, for any lender to be notified of any enforcement action before the action is contemplated. Obligations to use ADR in the event of dispute and a requirement that the state rent charges are reasonable, that works are undertaken to a reasonable standard and at a reasonable cost. I think that's the way forward. And interestingly, I think the new Homes Code 
assists. Because again, there's this idea of transparency, of communication, and of reasonableness that seems to underpin the entirety of the code. So I think we're probably going in the wrong direction when we say let's exclude relevant sections of the LPA so that remedies which are draconian and drastic from the perspective of the rent charge payer and any lender that secured property, secured funding on the property subject to the rent charge, instead of going down that route, let's go down another route that affords protection for our client. And as I mentioned to you earlier, with regard to the code and the reservation fees that are payable, the idea that the buyer should have disclosed to them, not just issues with regard to a contract completion, but also ongoing costs that the uh, buyer is likely to be required to meet as a consequence of the purchase need to be disclosed. That would include estate rent charges, in my view. I've given you some case law relating to estate rent charges. You can have a look at it. It's in the notes. I want to switch along, however, because I am conscious of time, to uh, page uh, 16 of the notes, where we start looking at some leasehold purchases. Before I do that, I do mention conservation covenants. Just quickly, the idea of a conservation covenant I'm a developer, local authority or other public body says, well, yeah, we'll allow you planning permission to build your 150 houses, but we want you to use some of the land that you own for conservation purposes. So you're required to enter into a conservation covenant relating to, I don't know, the creation of woodland or management of woodland or parks or other natural facilities. Well, where a developer is being met with a conservation covenant that has a cost implication, then you are seeing estate rent charges being utilised to enable the property owners that are benefiting from the amenity value generated by the conservation works that are being met, meeting the cost of those works. So just be aware of that. Again, I've given you detail in the notes that you can have a look at at your leisure. I mentioned shared ownership leases very quickly because we've now got a new shared ownership lease, which has a number of interesting provisions. Again, I'll scamper through them if I can. Firstly, staircasing now permissible in 1% increments. You can't roll over the entitlement year on year. It's limited to 1% each year. It is also important to understand that we can increase uh, staircase in increments of 5% as opposed to a minimum of 10% that we saw under the previous model lease. Again, as far as that is concerned, the ability to acquire 1% shares in the home is for the first 15 years that the property is owned. The whole idea of this is because there's been a failure of shared ownership leases. Um, as to what's actually happened to, compared to what the government originally intended. The government originally intended that someone would acquire a property of 10% stake, 5% stake or whatever, and then staircase, so that ultimately they owned 100% of the beneficial interest. Not realizing that a lot of people were happy to acquire a 5, 10, 15% stake in the property, but not want or not be able to afford to staircase anymore. So the idea of the change, Excuse me, the changes to staircasing are designed to try and encourage more staircasing. To that end, landlords can't change stair, uh, can't charge administration fees if staircasing is to be at a rate of 1% per annum for the first 15 years. The new lease should now provide that during the first 10 years of the term of the lease, the landlord will be responsible for external repairs. So we can't transmit cost into service charge and we can't seek sinking fund contributions for the cost of those repairs. So we've got a sort of blanket of protection relating to service charge, which again is interesting. It is important to understand, however, but because of this sort of blanket or moratorium, leaseholders still need to be aware of the service charge provisions under the lease. In addition to that, of course, 
the position is that clients need to understand and appreciate that where we have a service charge provision, non-payment of service charge can lead to a risk of forfeiture, as can non-payment of ground rent. And with shared ownership leases in particular, where we have not staircased to 100%, it is imperative that our client leaseholders understand and appreciate that they will be liable to repossession, even if they own 10%, 50%, 80% of the beneficial interest, if they haven't paid the rent on the amount of beneficial interest retained by the landlord, they are vulnerable to possession proceedings. In the past, I've referred to case law that sort of confirms the situation. It may seem in inequitable where someone has acquired more than 50% of a beneficial interest for them to lose the lot on the basis that they haven't paid the rent that was due to the landlord on the 50% of the beneficial interest retained by the landlord. But the courts don't seem to take into account any sort of equity on that basis. Um, preemption period now reduced to four weeks and the term of the lease minimum 990 years rather than what we saw in the past. Security for lenders, again, we've got a reiteration of a clause requiring lenders to be given notice prior to landlords exercising forfeiture. If that clause wants varying, if a developer or um, provider wants to vary that provision, consent from Homes England is required to permit that variation. Other provisions, condition of grant funding that a key information document pack is given by a landlord with a memorandum of sale. Very similar to what we're seeing with the code. The idea of front loading of information for leaseholders of shared ownership leases so that they can make an informed decision as to whether or not they in fact wish to proceed. The interesting thing about that is that what we have, I think, is a change in emphasis with regard to the work that a conveyancer does. So I can see a situation that conveyancers are required to sort of intervene earlier on in a transaction to give advice about the information that's been provided in connection with the shared ownership lease or the new property, as we saw in the code. Subletting clauses with regard to shared ownership leases, again, have been altered. So now what we've got is a position that the shared ownership lease provides clarity. The tenant leaseholder can um, allow a paying guest to be taken in. But again, just so that we're quite clear, that relaxation would not allow anything like an Airbnb letting or traditional form of subletting. The idea is that we're taking in a lodger and nothing more. There is provision for rent review. Again, the idea of rent review is that we are looking at um, review connected to retail price indexes. I've mentioned this before. I worry about any form of lease, shared ownership or otherwise, where rent review is connected to any form of indexation on the basis that I can't say what the retail price index will be when this shared ownership lease is subject to review. And therefore, clients need to be warned that there is an element of the unknown in that regard. Service charge, an important point, and again, this is an interesting thing, and I'd ask you to check your standard letters if you're doing shared ownership work. Just because we have only acquired a 10% stake in the leasehold property does not mean we're only liable for 10% of service charge. We're, we're liable for the entirety of the service charge in connection with our flat or apartment, notwithstanding the fact that we have only acquired a portion of the beneficial interest in the property. I mentioned in the notes as well the fact that we should be ensuring that the leaseholder understands 
that they are responsible for repairing the property, even though they only have a 50% stake in it. The lease obliges them to carry out repairs to the demise. Not referred to in the new form of shared ownership lease, but a point that I always mention when dealing with shared ownership, watch the SDLT position, make sure the client is made aware of the advantage of electing to pay all the SDLT due on acquisition, rather than being met with additional SDLT liability as and when staircasing occurs. Of course, the vast majority of clients that are acquiring shared ownership leases will not be remotely interested in the benefit of paying all the SDLT up front, but there might be some, and there might be some that could, but don't realize the significance and the advantage of doing so. Only when they come to staircase at a later date do they realize that there could have been a not insignificant saving had they done as was available to them to pay SDLT up front. Mentioned in the notes, the leasehold pledge. Again, here just important to be aware of the fact that there is a requirement now for any lease that contains an obligation to uh, pay ground rent on review, which doubles or increases by more than doubling every 20 years to be varied and that new leases should not contain such provision. Note this is not an absolute bar on ground rents doubling, but just prevents them doubling in a period of less than 20 years. It is also appropriate to understand that as far as the pledge is concerned, it requires that landlords support leaseholders who wish to collectively enfranchise or wish to take over management responsibilities, that landlords should have complaints, processes and procedures that are fair and equitable. So the idea here again is a levelling off of the playing field as between landlord and leaseholders. Two or three things to share with you and one good habit. If you haven't seen the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership website, please have a look at it. It is a valuable resource for explaining what can be done for leaseholders that are faced with onerous provisions in residential leases. It highlights the steps that are being taken by interested parties in encouraging government to reform the law relating to residential leases. It does a number of things that I think are useful to clients that are faced with problems associated with cladding, facing problems associated with defective leases. The next thing I want to talk about are some developments that I think are quite interesting. First of all, the residential property developer tax. Again, as far as this is concerned, the aim is to recover or generate funds to meet cladding re remediation costs, but the tax isn't limited to developers that own properties that are subject to cladding remedi remediation. New tax that is going to impact on developers. And as I say, not limited to cladding issue. Second point that I make, Competition and Markets Authority have investigated lots of unfair leasehold contracts. And again, what you're seeing is developers, the, immediately the Competition and Markets Authority expressing an interest in what they've done or not done, um, attempting to um, circumvent claims, circumvent problems arising from the Competition and Markets Authority intervention and doing deals. So again, I've given you some details. The Leasehold Knowledge Partnership has a lot more information about developers, landlords that are subject to investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority. And most developers and builders will reach an accommodation where you are seeking a variation to a lease uh, that would re be regarded as unfair or unreasonable that the Competition and Markets Authority have looked at in the past and determined as being unreasonable. I've also given you details about the ground rent bill 
the idea of this is that we're looking at new lease, uh, new build leaseholders of residential long leases being required to pay a fixed upper corner amount. So again, useful. The idea is that there will be a restriction on ground rents on new long residential leases, fines for five a five thousand pounds for developers or freeholders that charge ground rent. But there are exceptions. Any community-led housing sector landlords are unlikely to be required to convert ground rent to peppercorn. And financial products where a lease is used instead of mortgage, so it's like finance type of arrangements, again are going to be exempt as well. The idea of this is that we're seeing reform to future leases. It applies to shared ownership leases, right to buy, leasehold properties, etc., but doesn't apply retrospectively. So, with regard to old leases, we're still going to be stuck. Again, I mentioned in the notes that what we have is the government sort of encouraging reform, but reserving the right for statutory reform or the spectre of common hold sitting behind if the government at some point in the future decides that the industry is not doing enough to protect leaseholders. I mentioned in the notes the role of the housing ombudsman. Again, quite a lot of detail there relating to complaint handling in connection with new bills, service charge, etc. Um, a lot of information there just explaining the jurisdiction of the housing ombudsman. Again, interesting to see um, once we start seeing reports from the housing ombudsman as to interventions that the ombudsman undertakes as a consequence of consumer complaints. But I haven't got anything to share with you at the moment to see what their stance will be, but rest assured that this is not a toothless tiger, that there is availability for seeking compensation from errant landlord developers or for seeking or en encouraging redress where complaints are justified. On that happy note, I'm going to finish, but I am conscious once more of overrunning slightly. But I think, Stephen, we started a little late, so I'm going to fig forgive myself and now ask if anyone has any questions or queries. Whilst I'm waiting for Steve to intervene at this point, again, if anyone has any questions or queries of me, I've put my email address on the slide. And of course, Stuart Title has a myriad of products that are available for just about every conceivable type of residential conveyancing transaction, from shared ownership leases to new builds. And therefore, Robert and Stephen and their team and colleagues are available for you if you have any questions or queries with regard to products that would be suitable or appropriate for circumstances that you have encountered or are currently encountering. Stephen, question time. Anything arising? Yeah, thank you very much, Ian. Um, yeah, as Ian says, we're now going to begin, begin answering questions submitted during the presentation today. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Um, Ian, straight away, I wanted to just bring in uh, Robert quickly, Robert Kelly, through a title. Um, I just had a point you wanted to mention um, about the roadway works. So, Robert, I don't know if you're there to yeah. ask that question. Yes, thanks, Stephen, uh, and thanks, Ian. Uh, just when you were talking about uh, 3.4 and 4 in the inquiries, yeah. one, one small yeah. but rather alarming point, which we've been uh, alerted to by clients in the last couple of weeks, is that a number of local authorities mm are now refusing to answer those inquiries. And yeah. whilst they aren't yeah. publicising it, it's there in the replies. So it's another point to actually read the replies you get, because yeah. the reply might be, we're not answering it. And obviously they can have yeah. some uh, consequences. So just ready to alert people to that. Good point. Thanks for that, Robert. Yeah. And of course, again, where, where you're in a situation where you're getting incomplete search results you've got products that will sort of cover that gap Robert yeah we do in fact we have been looking at a specific one to deal with just those inquiries um yeah. there because 
it's it's an unusual one. It's not a search delay. It's not search verification. Yeah. It's an actual refusal to answer, um, which yeah. does create sort of alarming thoughts for the future as to what local authorities will and won't answer. But yes, Absolutely. we can look at the product if people uh, have that problem. Brilliant. Thanks, Robert. Thank you for that. Stephen, okay, anything else? You. Yeah, there's a, there's a few questions. Just firstly, a, a comment from yeah. Mark Cairns he made right at the start. He said that it could be difficult to establish yeah. that the developer has built 165 houses in accordance with the permission rather than the 185 or that plans have been complied with. Um, so yeah. just a point there at the, 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 right at the start of the presentation. Um, Hillary yeah. asks, uh, when is the new homes quality code anticipated to be implemented? Yeah, well, it was the consultation period expired in June. I looked in September and I looked last week and there isn't any dates that I can give people. My gut reaction is that we will see it going live Easter next year. But the point is, yeah. Hillary and everyone else, that the developers and builders are aware of it. OK, and you know therefore you know if you're saying hey look the code says this then they, they can hardly turn around and say well i'm not aware of it and the industry has consulted with government about it and as far as i'm aware the government proposals have not been subject to any form of radical amendment which would imply to me that builders and developers are happy and supportive of it if there'd been an outcry by developers concerning it then i would have heard of it and the other thing hillary that is very important in my view is that remember the government is waving a big stick at developers and saying we've got this horrible concept called common hold which alleviates a lot of the problems that we're encountering with regard to leasehold that levels up the playing field generally relating to ongoing and future management of developments. And if developers are not going to play ball with us, then we could just insist that all new schemes are common hold schemes. Or if we're looking at leasehold specifically, we just introduce legislation that deals with a lot of the issues that we've been trying to deal with in conjunction with developers and builders. So I think that's the point. I don't think we're going to see it sort of being put into the long grass. I think developers are, at the moment are terrified about what government could do, and that um, behaviour arises from the clabbing scandal. And also, I think developers and builders now appreciate that they shouldn't be looking, particularly at leasehold schemes, as schemes for revenue generation in connection with ongoing management. It should be cost recovery and proper and reasonable management rather than revenue. So, a good question from Hillary. Yeah, in short, to tell everyone we don't have a date yet. My guess is Easter time. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Thanks Hillary, for that question. Yeah, yes. A um, couple of questions with regards to excluding uh, section 121. Uh, the, the first yeah. one is with regards to excluding section 121. What would be your advice regarding the developer or management company reserving the right to grant a lease over the property if the client fails to make the payment? Well, yeah, the point is that there is, if assuming the management company or third party is the rent charge owner, then they're entitled to do it, even. Okay? And the point I'm making is I don't see how you can exclude the availability of a statutory remedy. So even if you wanted to, and even if contractually developer A has agreed with property owner B, such a provision, when developer A sells the site on or transfers it to a management company and property owner sells the freehold to a new owner, then I don't think those parties are bound by that agreement. So I, I would maintain that whilst you could have, and there's, there's certainly no harm in having pro express provision that excludes the operation of section 121, if I'm gonna hang my hat on it, I think that might be dangerous. And I think certainly when you look at the code, the provisions that I suggest are far more protective 
of the estate rent charge payer, the property owner, and would in essence achieve the same result as excluding the operation of one, two, one. Perfect. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. And uh, then a question from uh, Davina. Davina asks, in terms of conveyances attempting to exclude Section 121, uh, 3 and 4 of the LPA 25, yeah. most people are probably looking at lender requirements in the UK FML, which yeah. often state that they require provisions to be excluded. Um, are you aware of any movement from lenders to amend their instructions on this no. in the UK FML no, handbook? No. They won't. They won't. So what, what's happening, Davina, is that people are, are saying to developers, well, um, we want it out, okay, and developers are saying no, and then, of course, what you've got to do is you say to your lender client, well, I've asked, and the developer said no, um, and that's it, really. Now, I don't know, Robert, do you have, what, what, what policies do you have relating to estate rent charges? I was, I was just going to butt in there, Ian. Yes, we do have a lender-only estate yeah. rent charge policy yeah. for exactly that situation yeah. to protect the lender yeah. if, uh, yeah. and it is unlikely, but if in the situation that they lost the value of their investment in the property due to 121, yeah. we would compensate them. Um, a number of lenders accept it. As you say, some still in the finance handbook say they won't. Um, yeah. But I think it, the argument you've put forward today is a very strong one that actually they are, the comfort they're taking from clauses in the documentation is actually rather false comfort and the insurance policy is a better protection for them. Yeah, I, I would, certainly if I was advising a lender, I would say, well, you know, the, the one two one issue hasn't been tested. I think it's unlikely to be tested. And therefore you've always got this niggle, uh, and I apologize for the fact that I'm sort of heightening the niggle for practitioners, uh, and the, the same thing is to take out indemnity cover. Yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? Okay, Steve, next one. Thank you. Yeah, um, Karen just uh, responded uh, saying, regards section 121, I seek a variation to ensure full notice, brackets two months before enforcing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's reasonable, uh, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Keely asked, does an estate rent charge have to be called, referred to as an estate rent charge for it to be one, no. uh, or for it to be one, sorry, no. or if the transfer refers to it as service maintenance charges, would this be seen as an estate rent charge as both are for the benefit of the estate? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a great question, Stephen. It's not, it's not what you call it. It's effect that uh, would enable it to be an estate rent charge. So you can call it Perfect. whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And thanks, Kelly, for that question. Um, there are there are a lot of questions coming through, so I think I will have to put a, a stop to this. And anyone that we don't get to, we will respond to after the, the webinar. Yeah. But thank you for everyone to uh, submitting the questions. I've just asked a couple more of a canny. And um, Lana asks, have the yeah. new bills home warranty providers indicated that they expect their registered developers to follow the new homes code that is to be brought into force? Yeah, I think so. From what I've seen, the answer to that question is yes. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lana, for that one. Um, I think uh, James, maybe on a previous course with, with you in, um, he says, hi, in another great course, thank you. Um, I much enjoyed your course on easements the other day. I wonder if you're still taking questions on that. So I think that's probably from a separate thing, so we can deal with that uh, separately. Um, my question yeah. relates to opening up an access way off a private road. I think this is going to be um, an easement one, so perhaps we'll take this offline with James and respond to uh, separately, if that's yeah. okay, uh, James. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What we'll do, Stephen, again, I'll, when I've got time, I'll, all the questions that come in, I'll deal with. And I'll copy you in so that you can share with delegates, you know, the questions about what we've been talking about today. And uh, if James has a question about an easement, I don't mind you sharing that with delegates as well. Right now. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, so just a final question for today. And as I say, we will come back to any other questions answered. Um, uh, yeah. Nimi asks, uh, please, can you confirm the pitfalls of buying a new build Ducky of Cornwall property with no title guarantee? And if this will have any effect on future saleability of the property, especially a buyer looking to obtain mortgage finance? Yeah, 
yeah, if a property is sold without um, any form of title guarantee whatsoever, then the position is that a buyer, the, the first buyer of such a property is vulnerable. If you're buying from the Duchy of Cornwall, of course, it's the ownership itself that is theoretically your protection. So the idea is, well, we don't need to give a title guarantee because we've got sufficient resources to be able to meet the claim in any event. The point I would make with regard to that is I've seen this situation arise quite frequently in the past and the Duchy of Cornwall will maintain its stance and not offer any form of title guarantee whatsoever. Once your client has owned, so your client has performed due diligence and then owned the property, when it comes to sale, you are able to offer a title guarantee on the basis that you perform due diligence on acquisition and nothing has been drawn to your attention during ownership that would impact on the ownership or the quality of title that you acquire. So what I would say is there's not much you can do about it. We can't compel a seller to provide a title guarantee. The only good news is that on acquisition, once you have acquired the title, you would then be able to sell and offer a title guarantee if requested. And of course, as far as conveyancing practice is concerned, a title guarantee does afford the buyer the protection that the guarantee itself offers. Namely, that if the title is not good and marketable, the owner of the property, the buyer of the property, could sue the seller for breach. In connection with the circumstances that Minnie mentioned, that availability of suing for breach in connection with quality of title would not exist due to the fact that no title guarantee is provided. So to answer the question, Minnie, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything you can do. If that's what's being offered to you, I think you've got to accept it. The good news is, I think, that in those circumstances, when you come to sell, you will be able to offer, at the very least, a limited title guarantee, potentially a full title guarantee, if the land is registered the abs uh, the land is due with an absolute title. But great question, Minnie. If you drop me a note, I'll do a little bit more research on it, but uh, that's my sort of... Uh, opinion as it were on the hoof perfect thank you Ian, and thank you Amy, for that yeah, question um i think we'll wrap yeah. up there Ian. so i'd just like yeah. to say thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar as we said we will respond to 20 questions that left unanswered. and if you do have any, any other questions please do contact Ian or myself once you leave the webinar today you will receive an automated message from go to webinar if you respond to this email, the replies come directly to me and I can send any questions or feedback on to Ian. You'll also receive a separate email from my colleague Robert Kelly, which will contain the slides and notes for today's session and a copy of the recording as well. So that just leaves me to say, on behalf of Stuart Title and IQ Legal Training, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>